Hello there, welcome back to Jenny Designs with Paper and this week's episode of Crime and Coloring, where we take an alphabetical journey through the United States and revisit some of the earliest crimes. But before we talk crime, let's talk coloring. This week I'm using my Prismacolor pencils. I have them in this binder where I keep a folded piece of you know, the paper with the color chart on it. I am creating two cards. I've already selected my colored pencils to match this pattern paper. This pattern paper came out of a six by eight pad of paper I bought at Joann's. It's a Park Lane is the brand name. I am going to be stamping on some 110 pound cardstock that is not Nina. It's not as smooth. I wanted to see if it was a little, what, you know, how a less smooth cardstock would work with colored pencils. I'm going to be using those Lawn Fawn robots, the beep, beep, boop, or beep, bop, boop stamp set or something or other. Um, that balloon is a solid image stamp, as is the bow tie. So I will be stamping them in a light orange ink and then coloring over them with my colored pencils as well. I am not stamping the balloon string right away. I will die cut that out first and then stamp the string onto the die cut shape. I am using coordinating dies for this stamp set. This is one of my older stamp sets. It is kind of yellowed with age and I think that's probably because I used like a Stazon ink or some other solvent type ink on it at some point in time. I don't have very many stamp sets that have done that. Um, I will be stamping in Simon Says Stamp Intense Black Ink. And then I will leave the stamps in my Misty and restamp them with the Versaclair Nocturne Black Ink. The wax from the pencils does kind of um, settle on top of that black ink and I want to eliminate that. So I think that's all about the coloring. Um, so let's go ahead and jump into our crime. Our alphabetical journey today takes us back to the state of Missouri. As early as 1817, the citizens of the territory of Missouri were pushing for statehood. The catch was that at the time, there were currently 22 states in the United States, and they were pretty evenly divided between free and slave states. Missouri would upset the balance one way or the other. In order to keep the balance um, and the, have Missouri become a state, the acceptance of Maine as a state um, had was kind of the trade-off. Yes, you can have Missouri, but we also get Maine. So that meant that they, the United States stayed evenly divided between free and slave states. At the time that Missouri was um, created, the state of Missouri was created, it, they also created um, the Missouri Compromise. This was kind of the um, line in the sand, so to speak where slavery was not allowed to happen north of. This was like the, the slavery line. And this was a latitudinal line that ran through the area acquired in the Louisiana Purchase. So eventually, President James Monroe did sign the federal legislation on August 10, 1821, officially making Missouri the 24th state in the Union. Now, Missouri is a fountain state. It is home to more than 200 fountains. And because of its unique shape, it has eight bordering states. Missouri is home of President Harry Truman and the Missouri fox trotting horse. Interestingly enough, the state animal is not the fox trotting horse, but the mule. Missouri is home of Red's, the first drive through restaurant, and is literally the home of sliced bread. In no, uh, 1904, the Summer Olympics were first held in the United States in Missouri, and Missouri is home to a very harsh family feud. Kansas City, Missouri is the last home of Thomas Hunton Swope, a man who amassed great wealth and land and left his mark on the town and the state. Thomas was born on October 21st, 1827 in Lincoln County, Kentucky to John and Frances Swope and was the eldest of their seven children. Thomas was known in his childhood as a delicate, delicate bookworm. He was an avid reader and went on to study at Central College in Danville, Kentucky before entering law school in 1848. However, after, after graduating from Yale Law, he never practiced law. Apparently, 
He graduated Yale and had some money to invest and began traveling around looking for that investment opportunity. He did come from a not poor family. <clears throat> Eventually, Thomas made his way to St. Louis and began investing in land, in real estate. He went as far west as the Kansas Territory and continued his real estate investments into the area that would become Kansas City, settling on the Missouri side. His plan, which turned out to be very lucrative, was to purchase farmland, and then as the city and the surrounding areas grew, subdivide that farmland into cities and neighborhoods. In 1893, city leaders were pushing for a citywide beautification of St. Louis, and this project included things like parks, streets, and sidewalks or, or um, walkways. The kicker, though, was that this project was to be paid for in property taxes, and someone owning a lot of land in the area that was subject to this beautification would be paying a lot of taxes. Now, it was said that Thomas was opposed to this because as a massive land owner at the time, he would be, the cost to him would be great. He would have to pay quite a bit of, of property tax. Um, he wasn't loved for his opposition to this beautification project. In fact, he was generally unliked by the public, and he was given, you know, nicknames through the news. Eventually, though, Thomas did give in, and in 1896, he donated the land that became, became Swope Park. This park still exists in Kansas City, and it's actually where, I mean, it's kind of a huge area, and there's even a zoo located there. <clears throat> His impact in the Kansas City area was so great that he eventually earned the honorary title of colonel, um, not through military ways, but just honorary. And that is actually not even what he is the most famous for. But before we get to Thomas's infamy, or I guess it would be infamy, let's meet Bennett Clark Hyde. Bennett was born on May 6, 1872 in Lexington, Missouri to Reverend George Washington and Anna January Hyde. I love that her name was Anna January. He was third of their fourth children and the only boy. He was also from a prominent family and was educated first at William Jewell College. And then he went on to attend the University Medical College where he trained to become a doctor. He was known to have a beautiful singing voice and was able to recite Shakespeare by heart. As an adult, his reputation was, well, not awesome. In 1897, Bennett was the Kansas City police surgeon. A police surgeon is the medical personnel in charge of the health and well-being of jailed inmates. While he was in this position, there was a very ugly incident um, Bennett, or Dr. Hyde, as he was now known, was, and, and he was a white man, was accused of abusing a black woman named Annie Clemens. It didn't specify what type of abuse. So I don't know what the actual al allegations were. Um, his, this um, did not go over very well. In fact, after many protests from community leaders and church officials, he was removed from the position of, as police surgeon. <clears throat> this wasn't the only skeleton in Dr. Hyde's closet. In the 18th and 19th century, medical students had to provide their, provide their own cadavers for their medical studies. The year after he was fired from his job as the police surgeon, Dr. Hyde was arrested for being the ringleader of a major grave robbing ring. He was accused of hiring a, quote, gang of ghouls to systematically rob local cemeteries in order to source cadavers for medical students. I am sure he did not do this out of the goodness of his heart, but more out of the desire to pad his pocketbook. He also, on top of that, had a reputation of being a ladies' man, kind of a Romeo, but not the good kind. The, the rumors were that he would enter into less than um, desirable for the time relationships with um, older women or widowed women and 
abscond or bilk them out of their money. So, yeah, he did not have a fabulous reputation. But in spite of all of this, most of the time people just liked him. I know, he was able to walk up to people and introduce himself and shake their hand and and they would walk away having a more than favorable impression of him in spite of his his failings. Now, how do these two social opposites create a family feud? Well, I'm about to tell you, Thomas never married. He continued to, through his whole adult life, to develop this real estate portfolio and amass wealth. Um, and already coming from a wealthier than average family, that's pretty substantial. He was, however, a notoriously private individual. Um, he gave generously to the community. He donated money to hospitals and land, donated land and money to the hospitals, to the YMCA, and he had a soft spot for animals and organizations like the Humane Society. And remember how we talked about that land he donated for the city park? It was over a thousand, like a thousand, like 1,300 acres. And it became the largest park in the city and one of the largest municipal parks in the country. Because he never married, Thomas planned to leave his estate mostly to charities. Um, one of his brothers was a man named Logan. Logan married a woman named Maggie. And they had a number of children, including a daughter named Frances. Now, sometime in late 1904 or early 1905, Frances met Dr. Bennett Hyde. Maggie was not a fan. Maggie was aware of his reputation. She had heard the rumors and she did not think he was good enough for her daughter. And she made that opinion known. Um, she even offered to purchase her daughter Frances a trip through Europe if she would end her relationship with um, Bennett. But then on June 21st, 1905, Francis and Dr. Hyde eloped. The newspapers in the area printed headlines like, quote, a wedding in Fayetteville, Arkansas, proves a surprise to the bride's mother. So clearly Maggie and Logan were unaware of Francis's elopement or her desire to marry Bennett. Um, that could not have made Maggie like Dr. Hyde any more than she already did not, right? He literally ran away with her daughter. Um, after the wedding, after the elopement, Frances and her mother Maggie stopped talking to each other almost entirely. And it stayed that way for quite some time. Thomas, however, purchased the newly married couple a house on Forest Avenue in Kansas City. The family association with Thomas gave Dr. Bennett Hyde immediate social step up, step up like this increased his social standing dramatically. Dr. Hyde then became the president elect of the Jackson County Medical Society. And why not? His uncle by marriage had actually donated the land to the hospital, like where the hospital had been built. Um, the estrangement between Maggie and Francis continued until Francis's brother was injured in a Nevada mine and Maggie called her son-in-law, Dr. Bennett Hyde, to come and take care of her injured son. So Logan and Maggie lived on a large family estate. It was an elaborate 26 room, it was called the Swope Mansion. And it sat on Pleasant Street and on top of a high hill in Independence. And it was like 19 acres. The mansion was home to Logan and Maggie and their children, as well as some extended family members. And sometime in 1909, after Maggie's death, Thomas actually moved into the Lo to Logan's family home, the Swoop Mag Mansion, or Soap it's S-W-O-P-E, soap. I don't know how to pronounce that. Soap, soup. If you're from Kansas City, tell me how I'm saying that wrong. Anyway, Thomas lived on the upper floor and his, he had a reputation for hiding out there, smoking cigars and drinking. So he was like the family, um, 
introvert, maybe the family weirdo. I don't know. Um, odd things began to happen in the Swope family over the next um, few months. On October 1st in 1909, um, one of the cousins, J. Moss Hunton, had a stroke. Um, Dr. Hyde and the family doctor were called to treat him, and the two doctors agreed that they should bleed him. In the early 1900s, bleeding was still the medical solution to many health issues. However, there was some concern among the family members that the bleeding had gone on too long, especially when they noticed the amount of blood that had been collected in the basin. It was noted that even Frances commented to her husband that maybe he had been bled long enough, and the concern was legitimate. And shortly after the doctors had bandaged him up, Moss died. And in spite of, or maybe because of, Dr. Hyde's reputation, there were questions about the care of Thomas's cousin Moss and whether or not his death had been avoidable. Two days later, on a Sunday morning, Thomas's nurse, Pearl Keller, took up his breakfast and a digestive pill that had been given to her by Dr. Hyde. Everything was fine for about 20 minutes, and then Thomas broke out into a cold sweat, started shivering, and then fell into a coma. His nurse, Pearl, stated that he gained consciousness long enough to say he wished he had never taken the dang pill. 81-year-old Thomas died that night. Now, Thomas didn't have the best health. He was a drinking and a smoking up in his attic room. But dying just a few days after his cousin was a bit odd. And the fact that the family had lost two beloved family members in just a few days wasn't even the oddest thing. You see, Cousin Moss, he was the executor of Thomas's will a will that had been written to leave most of his wealth to charities, leaving a smaller sum to just his nieces and nephews. However, in the weeks and days before his untimely death, Thomas had been thinking about leaving less and less to his nibblings and more and more to charity. And at the time of Thomas's death, his fortune was estimated at about $3.6 million, which is the equivalent <coughs> of more than $100 million today. Following Thomas's death, the family lawyer read the will and it became immediately clear that his fortune was firmly in the family hands, which was seemingly contradictory to what people thought he, what he thought, what they thought he was doing with his money. Um, the nieces and nephews, each of Thomas's nieces and nephews were awarded like $140,000, which is somewhere near $4 million in today's money. Keep in mind that Frances is one of Thomas's nieces. Okay. And according to Nurse Pearl, hours after Cousin Moss died, Dr. Bennett Hyde offered himself up to be the new executor of Thomas's will. Hours. Not days, not weeks, hours. Now, Dr. Bennett Hyde put himself right in the thick of things. He had a vested interest in Thomas's will, both as a volunteered executor and as the husband of one of those who inherited money. Add to that some of Dr. Hyde's behaviors in the week before the deaths. Um, and things start to look a little bit hinky. Two weeks before Thomas accepted that caps, the, the capsule, the medicine from Bennett, the physician, Dr. Hyde, had made two phone calls, or two calls, I guess not phone calls, two calls. He'd gone to Hugo Brecklin's drugstore in the downtown area. One was to order a medicine called Fairchild's Holodin. It was a digestive compound that was given for people who were having some indigestion problems. The other was to order several capsules of cyanide, one of the quickest and most lethal poisons to men, to human, to people, to things. 
And at the time, those two pills were identical in size, shape, and color. About a month after the death of Moss, Hunton, and Thomas Swope, in late November, another misfortune befalls the household. Typhoid fever. Two of Maggie's children, Margaret and Chrisman, were some of the first to fall ill, but the epidemic spread more and more throughout the family, the friends, the servants. And the timing was terrible because it's November and they've just had these deaths. But the weirdest thing about this epidemic was that doctors in the area could not recall any other case of typhoid in Independence the entire year. Okay, just, just ponder that for a moment. The Swope family ended up calling in five nurses, their family physician and Dr. Bennett Hyde. Chrisman was particularly ill and he was running a high fever. So on December 5th, Dr. Hyde gave Chrisman a pill that he claimed was fever medicine. Within 30 minutes of taking that pill, Chrisman fell into convulsions and then a coma. Nurse Pearl said that was exactly the same thing that happened to Thomas just a month earlier. By the following night, the previously healthy 31-year-old Chrisman Swope was dead, the third family member to die in just two months. The mystery continued to stump the medical community. Typhoid was usually transmitted through contaminated food or water. And typically, only like 5% of those who contracted the disease died. <clears throat> um, a pathologist was called in to test the family's food and water to determine where the contamination originated. Nothing was found. The water was clean. The food was uncontaminated. And the pathologist commented that, quote, it was as if the infection had been administered to the family with all the precision of a scientific experiment. End quote. That was not really a far-fetched idea, as it turns out. In the early 1900s, the study of germs was a regular thing for doctors. And that's why Dr. Edward Stewart thought nothing of it when his friend, Dr. Bennett Hyde, asked him, Dr. Stewart's a bacteriologi bacteriologist, that word I can't say properly. Dr. Hyde asked him to help him set up a laboratory in November 1909 to jumpstart his research. Dr. Stewart gave Dr. Hyde some everyday germs from his personal stash, his laboratory. He also gave him some salmonella typhi the bacteria that causes typhoid fever. Fast forward a few weeks to the outbreak in the Swope family and Dr. Stewart is now concerned. One day while Dr. Hyde was out of his um, office, Dr. Stewart snuck into Bennett's laboratory to look at the bacterial cultures. And what he found was that the typhoid culture had been modified from the sample he had originally given to Dr. Hyde and that in his opinion, there were enough germs um, removed to, quote, inoculate the whole of Kansas City. So Dr. Hyde had made enough to get all of Kansas City sick. Dr. Seward wasn't the only one becoming suspicious. Nurse Pearl, uh, her name's Pearl Keller. I just think it's cool. Her name is Pearl. Nurse Pearl had from the beginning questioned Dr. Hyde's procedures. Pearl gathered all of the other nurses together and they approached Dr. Twyman, the family doctor, as a group. And this group of nurses, the ones that were hired during the typhoid outbreak, expressed openly their concern with Dr. Hyde's frequent use of strychnine injections. Strychnine is lethal in large doses. And at that time, in the 1900s, it was only used medicinally um, as a stimulant. So like when somebody's heart rate was dropping and the nurse whose job it was to monitor the heart rates of the sick patients commented that she saw no need for the injections. 
she did not believe as a trained nurse that there was any danger of too low of heart rates. So led by Nurse Pearl, the rebel band of nurses gave the Swope family an ultimatum. Either Dr. Hyde leaves or the nurses leave. And in the end, um, the Swoop family told Dr. Twyman to tell Dr. Bennett to leave, not to come back. And a funny thing happens when Dr. Bennett Hyde leaves. All of the family members start to get better. Strict nine, my hiney. The Swoop family was mostly successful in keeping this kind of family feud out of the public eye until shortly after Christmas that year. They arranged to have independent and secret autopsies of Chrisman and Thomas performed. Now, Thomas had not been buried yet because they were preparing a, a tomb or mausoleum for him in the park named after him. So he was just being kept um, on ice somewhere, like literally on ice somewhere until his mausoleum or tomb or whatever could be completed. So to avoid publicity, the family had these autopsies done in secret by removing the bodies from the forest. Well, they took Chrisman's body from the Forest Hill Cemetery in the middle of the night. And even though they were trying to be all secrety and hush hush and stuff, the newspapers knew about it the next day. There were a lot of delays in the release of the autopsy results. And after 18 days, the results were released and to no one's surprise. And, you know, it was reported in the papers as well. Thomas and Chrisman's swoop had been found to be poisoned with strychnine. And even more troubling was that the conclusion was that Thomas's own nephew-in-law was a suspected murderer. Of course, with all the influential people involved, the case quickly attracted two very high-profile Kansas City lawyers who themselves were old adversaries. The special prosecutor was James Reed, and he was a former Kansas City mayor and a powerful member of the GOAT faction of the Democratic Party. Representing the defense was Frank Walsh, a member of the Rabbits, a different faction of the Democratic Party in Kansas City. On Febu in February of 1910, a coroner's jury found that Thomas Swope had indeed died by strychnine poisoning, which they believed was administered by a capsule. Then in March, a grand jury handed down 11 indictments against Dr. Bennett, including charges of first-degree murder in the death of Thomas and Chrisman Swoop, Swoop, or Soup, Soap, Swoop, I don't know, I keep forgetting how I'm pronouncing it, sorry, and charges of manslaughter in the case of Moss, J. Moss Hunton, the cousin, Bennett was also charged with using typhoid germs to poison the Soup family, um, Lucy Lee, Sarah, and Stella, and several other family members um, specifically. Chrisman, you know, obviously. Um, now, see, one report said that Margaret was also poisoned, but I thought she died when Thomas moved before Thomas moved in, so before 1909. So, I don't know. I don't know about that timeline there. But anyway, a murder trial began in April of 1910 to a packed courtroom. Nation or national papers rather sent correspondents from as far away as New York and Chicago. And very quickly, Dr. Bennett Hyde's trial focused mostly on the murder of Thomas Swope. Everything else that he had been accused of became evidence of Dr. Hyde's crime and motive. The prosecution's case really rested on the fact that the fewer Swope family members remained alive, the more Dr. Hyde and his wife Frances stood to inherit from their um, from Frances's uncle Thomas's fortune. Strychnine was used in capsules to treat dyspepsia, which is indigestion, but not in any quantity that would be toxic. So the question was, did Dr. Hyde Add more lethal le levels of strychnine to the amount to, um, contained in the capsule to make it lethal? Or was it the injections? Or were the injections the typhoid? I mean, so many questions, right? Um, Francis Swoop or Swope and 
Others in the community believed that Bennett was innocent. Dr. Hyde was a very well-connected member of the medical community, and it made sense that he had a lot of friends in town who did not or would not believe he was guilty. But it also might have had been more of an unbelief that someone in their social in their social stature or social circles could um, not be a murderer, right? Um, rich people don't do that kind of stuff, right? I mean, come on, whatever. When Dr. Hyde took the stand, he did not do a very good job of calming people's minds. Um, when he was asked why he needed all of the cyanide capsules, his response that he want was that he wanted to kill rats and unwanted dogs. That was uncommon. Okay, probably unheard of to use capsules to kill animals. Um, finally, after three days and or three nights and two days of de deliberation, the jury found Dr. Bennett Clyde Hark guilty of murdering Colonel Thomas Swope. The Swope family barely had a moment to celebrate before Frank Walsh had filed an appeal with the Missouri Supreme Court, which eventually threw out the verdict. The basis of the, of the appeal was that the other crimes that Dr. Hyde had been accused of could not be used as evidence or motive, especially when they were only using the one act, the murder of Thomas, to get a conviction for all of the things. So the state of Missouri versus Dr. Hyde in the Supreme Court of 1911 is still a leading case on causation in murder cases. It is still one of the um, standing authorities. Another sticking point that the appeal court had was that the autopsies of Thomas and Crisman um, were questionable. The argument was that the results of an autopsy on a frozen body done in the dark couldn't be accurate. Two more trials followed. One was a mistrial because a juror got up and left in the middle of the trial. A third was a hung jury because they just could not decide if he was guilty or innocent. There was talk of a fourth trial, but due to costs and stuff like that, the, they never um, scheduled the fourth trial, and the case was actually dismissed. And in 1917, Dr. Bennett Hyde walked free. With his ir um, reputation irreparably stained in Kansas City, Bennett moved back to his hometown of Lexington, Missouri. He worked as a truck driver and a mechanic, but eventually did go back into medicine. Meanwhile, Frances divorced Bennett in 1920. She was granted custody of their children. Um, her, and, and she actually went back to her father's house and um, was able to make amends and repair the relationship with her family. When Frances's divorce attorney asked her about Bennett's mood and behavior, she responded, Quote, he has grown more and more sullen and irritable. He has been very ugly, very disagreeable, very discourteous. He has spoken in impure and vulgar language and has been abusive. He has kept the children in a state of irritation and has taught them to disregard me and my wishes and to show disrespect and to deceive me. I don't want him to see them at all. End quote. But when asked if she believed that Bennett was guilty, she responded, quote, absolutely not. I stand just as I always stood, end quote. Nine years later, Bennett was interviewed by the Kansas City Star about the presumed guilt he still carried, and he spoke very bitterly about the years of court cases and the public humiliation. But when the reporter responded showing some empathy, Bennett said, quote, don't pity me. Whatever you do, don't pity me. I have never pitied myself. I have been crucified. Yes, I have suffered as no other man has suffered. I ask only for justice, simple justice, end quote. Today, Dr. Bennett Hyde is buried in an unmarked grave in a cemetery in Lexington. Thomas and Moss's deaths were always counted as murders and have never officially been solved. But it seems pretty clear to me who had the ability, who had the knowledge, and, and 
the foresight to make it look like they'd just died of illnesses or accident. If he had been a little more patient, Dr. Bennett Hyde might just have gotten away with this murder uns with an unscathed reputation and a very fat pocketbook. The Swoop Estate in Independence, Missouri, the site of Moss, Thomas, and Chrisman's deaths, was actually demolished in 1960. One source that I used said that Thomas moved into Logan and Maggie's house after Maggie died in 1909. He moved in in 1909. But then one source said that Maggie was one of the people who came down with typhoid fever, which also happened in 1909. So I am not exactly sure if Maggie was dead or alive when Thomas died. But the one source also says that Maggie was there when her son Chrisman died. So probably Thomas moved in before Maggie died. Um, I did not look up Maggie, Maggie's um, death record. I should have, so I would know when she, was, when she died. Then I could have clarified that. But I, I did not catch that discrepancy until just now for some reason. Okay, so about our case today. We have a doctor whose name is, oddly enough, Dr. Hyde. And he has a laboratory to study germs. And then he, his whole family comes down with typhoid, a germ that he has got in his laboratory that he has altered in what another doctor thinks is enough to infect an entire, or inoculate an entire city. Inoculate was a phrase he used, which means to give a shot to the entire city of Kansas City. That's a lot of typhoid germs on a syringe. I'm just saying. And then you have an entire family where people are ill from a disease that people at this point in time aren't usually dying from, even though they get sick and they're dying from that. All within like a month or five weeks of the first kind of unfortunate slash suspicious death. You know, it all starts with Moss, who has a stroke, and his treatment is to be bled out, or be, to be bled, but then he's bled out. And then you have Thomas, who dies from an accidental overdose of medicine, supposedly for indigestion. I still question that. I don't even know. Like, I don't know how they couldn't get a conviction. That's all I'm saying. I don't know how they couldn't get a conviction. Anyway. I hope you enjoyed hanging out with me today and watching me color these cute little robots with my color pencils. And I hope you enjoyed the story. And I do, in fact, have a group of photographs. The first photograph is Thomas, Colonel Thomas Swoop or Swoop. This is a group of ladies. One in the middle is Maggie and with two of her other daughters, the two that got typhoid, I believe. This is Francis. And this is Dr. Bennett Hyde. He's not an ugly man, I'm just saying. And this is a family estate that was eventually torn down. Thanks for hanging out with me today. I hope you enjoyed our story. I have a couple of other videos here I think you would like. I also have that subscribe button. If you have not yet subscribed, I would love it if you did. Leave me a thumbs up. Leave me a comment down below. Tell me if you think Dr. Hyde did it and if they should have got a conviction or not. Thanks for hanging out with me. Have a really great day.